Right, we're going to hit about four or five different lectures today. The first one being color models and color models. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you a bunch of mini little lectures on the basics of some of the other stuff that I've given you already, but I'm giving you it this time in single context. So today, looking at the concept of color, just talking about color, nothing else. Not how it works with shapes, not how it works with scenes or worlds or diagrams. So colors come in two forms. They come in the appearance and they come in the shade. The appearance would be the physical properties in terms of its color attributes. And in terms of the, the shade or the lightness, the brightness has to cross over. So color actually crosses over with light as a concept. Also crosses over with shading as a concept. So we have models, and we have the RGB model, and we have the color spaces, and we have drawing buffers, and we have all sorts of different things that are associated with the concept, so that's what this lecture is about. So color spaces and draw buffers. And so we have this kind of concept going on in terms of the rendering that's associated with coloring, and this is a nice pretty little colored sheet here. The models themselves are mathematical based. So we have mathematical protocols for defining colors with, and here we go, the RGB color scale, the red, green, and the blue. This is what we're using in most of the modern day graphic applications that are fourth generation. What I mean by fourth generation, I mean VRML, even OpenGL. But OpenGL actually can work a little bit lower, can work with the HSV and also with the CYMK, which you, you don't normally get with your fourth generation or your higher level languages. So at the highest level, the basic computer graphics actually started out with the RGB scale. Meaning, because if you think about the, uh, what I told you about monitors and equipment, this was based upon the capabilities of the light rays that were being flashed. There's three light rays that populate pixels and they do it in different intensities and depend upon how much uh, green and how much blue and how much red you're going to stick in there, you're going to get different colored shades and that's pretty much how it works actually. So it comes back from the hardware implementation but it's the scale that we use in graphics to say turn on this amount of light, turn on that amount of light, and turn on that amount of light in combinations of three and they're associated with the red, red, green, and blue scale. So actually this is what you learn when you're a kid and you know how to color your paint, you, know, you have red, green, you can make any color combination you want out of these three colors. And you just combine them together with the paint. And then all of a sudden you have a nice blue sky, and you have a green grass, and you have all the different combinations. So that's what most people are familiar with when they think about computer graphics. So now we have hue, saturation, and value, or brightness as another color scale. And um, in terms of the value would be the intensity of the brightness associated with that saturation or hue or combinations. So that would be the HSV, hue, saturation, and value scale. We also have the cyan, yellow, magenta, and black scale. This is more popular in higher, I should say more third generation graphic programs, a little bit more lower in the hierarchy. And lower in the hierarchy means you have more control over the features. So you're going to get probably a combination and options of both or all three in modern day graphics packages. Uh, so this is the focus in terms of the, the models and their mathematical model base. So here's the RGB. It's a little bit more on each one of them here. Red, green, blue, and different com combina combinations. They're additive color mixing in different intensities. And so you can see the purple and you can see the cyan and the white and the yellow that come out of the two. Used for many types of monitors and projectors. So this is where it kind of came from. Ca uh, cathode ray tubes, LCDs, D DLPs and others use the same model. Actually they still use the same model. In fact you can adjust it usually on the projector scale, the RGB scale, to make your picture look better. So here's the cyan, yellow, magenta, black. So it's subtractive color mixing. You're taking it away instead of adding it to the picture. So here you add certain amounts of RGB produces a mixture. Here you take it away. So it's subtractive color mixing used in printing to describe the inks to use. In fact you'll see this on color printers. Primitive early day color printers 
came with a CYMK cartridge. And it kind of has this little picture on it, actually. Some of them actually did have a picture to kind of show you that um, we are essentially combining this scale. It creates a little bit more realistic for printing. Uh, gives us different combinations, gives us different support. We can still achieve the same similar yellow. In fact, here's the yellow here, or this is the same yellow here. Same green, kind of a different contrast of the green, essentially, but the um, magenta is still there. So same combinations are there, but the color and mixing. This is uses one, two, three, four separate cartridges on some printers, actually. They have the four different cartridges rather than three. If you imagine four, you've got higher level of combinations. So you have more color potential with this scale. Also, you know, it's not necessarily a add more, add more. It's also done mathematically in a subtractive kind of manner. And then we have the hue scale, which comes from uh, lights, actually. The light uh, from if you've taken chemistry or actually it's probably more of a phys physics concept, light rays for hues. So it ranges from degrees and in intensity. Uh, also temperatures. In fact, if you ever see on a monitor, sometimes you have a temperature scale. You make it cold or you make it warm. You're adjusting this HSV scale is what you're adjusting. You're not adjusting the RGB. You're getting the warmth or the coldness, uh, which is going to give you or denotes different locations in the light spectrum. So it's the amount of light. So in a combination, it gives you different colors, actually. Uh, so here's the Q range from 0 to... 360 degrees denotes the locations in the light spectrum. The saturation is the intensity of the color, 0 to 1 in terms of its scale. And then the brightness is the lightness or the darkness of the color. So you can kind of see in this pattern here where it goes really light to really dark, almost black on the bottom, which is where you're getting your warm and your cold, your warmer lights are going to have more uh, intensity to them. Um, because they're warmer, they have a higher degrees. So, all of this stuff is stored in buffers, and the buffers are gathered. Excuse me, the buffers are part of the graphic hardware or the system that you're using for the rendering pipeline. And the buffers. So, there's many different types of buffers. Sometimes the buffers uh, that is stored for each one of the pixels. So you might hold the data for each one of the pixels in primitive <laughs> RGB graphic lit LCDs. It's each one of the pixels has a buffer, you know, a number sequence for each one of the red, blue, and greens for, for, for population of that particular pixel and then all the pixels together. I imagine there's tons of pixels on that one screen um, are calculated together for the full image. So many buffers hold uh, data for each pixel. All buffers for the same window have the same dimensions hopefully because if you change the dimensions you're going to change the with the way that the picture is painted on the on the per pixel. And buffers may hold different types or amounts of data per pixel, depending upon the application. So then we have different buffer types. We have color, depth, alpha, stencil, accumulation types. Um, you don't really need to know the buffer types if you were to build a program that was working with um, a buffer and you needed to adjust because sometimes you have extra room in programming to add different types of buffers to hold different information. It might tell you, you know, some additional support that might be needed for your application um, in terms of the different types that might be used. So here's our what we're calling the frame buffer. So it comprises of all the buffers used to store the data per pixel and fragment. So your frame buffer might be the size of your window, but probably not. You're going to have many different frame buffers. So your, your frame buffers are going to populate the window. And here we have the color, the depth, the alpha, the stencil, the accumulation of the different information that's being used to populate the frame. And then you have so many frames per minute that get populated on the window, which just gives us our frame, our frame um, construct, our frame abstraction, let me put it that way. The depth buffer. So in terms of our different types of buffer, what we're going to go through is the color buffer, which we kind of looked at already, the depth buffer, the alpha, the stencil, um, some of the different characteristics, which I haven't covered yet. Depth buffer. Additional components for the frame buffer holds the depth value of each one of the fragments. In, the, in photography, they call that field of depth. You can adjust the depth, you know how far out the angle is going, so how deep you're looking into the picture. 
Um, so there's different characteristics uh, in terms of styles of picture taking to maximize the depth or to create an artificial depth when one doesn't exist. Same concept, but it's being applied towards the information that's going to be populated out onto the frame. It's going to be associated with the depth, deepness, or the, the range or narrowing or thick or widening of the depth of the, of the uh, data that's being populated. Holds the depth value for each one of the fragments. Needs to be cleared like color buffer needs to be cleared. Every time you populate and make a new cycle through, everything has to be cleared out automatically. In fact, it's pretty easy to clear it out. You just zero out all of the values. And then you populate the buffer with more information. So here you can see that the two people are in, this guy's in front of this guy, and it's in front of this guy back here. This is the same picture, but this is the information. This is the depth buffer itself, shown in a gray scale, and here's one with color. So we have this that's keeping track of, um, this is light. The lighter portions are more present towards the camera angle. So the, the, the further back you go, the darker you go in color intensity. Uh, because you don't necessarily have to paint anything too far back. In fact, if you keep track of the depth the buffer correctly, you don't have to paint anything behind what is currently not visible. And the buffer can keep track of that information for you. So setting up a depth test, which you can do, and this, this is OpenGL code. You can't do this in VRML um, because it just doesn't have the capability. Um, you can open OpenGL disables the depth test by default, but you can put it in there. If you do a depth test, then you can use that information to make the program run faster because if the depth is too far back and you can't see it, don't render it. So it allows you to do hidden surface removal, and it's used a lot for um, back, back calling, you know, get, get rid of stuff um, that's not in the viewable plane, um, and also speeding up the, uh, by painting the screen from the depth buffer from forward to back, you speed up the process of how fast that image actually shows up to the screen as well. And you're doing this in terms of your painting in the OpenGL environment. So it turns it off, so you have to turn it on. So uh, we have additional part of the frame buffer that needs clearing, so we can actually clear the frame buffer if we wanted to. And we use, and these are actually just function calls that are being used. GL enable, uh, enable with the GL depth test. Um, and this is looking at the buffer bit and clearing the buffer bit, GL clear, and then initialize the display mode with the RGB single. So in, G, in OpenGL you have all of, you have about three different display mode settings that you can use. In uh, VRML, no, you know, it assumes RGB for everything. You can't really change that. Um, I mean, you can modify it through other packages, but normally you're not going to work with that at that level. So, and here's a, an example for when you need to draw the context that has a depth buffer to it. And running the code for it, you'd run a display method, uh, which would display um, and in this particular case, it's displaying, uh, looks like a bunch of polygons to the screen triangles. So you enable it, you clear it, you populate it, so set up the state of the drawing. And then in terms of the initialization, this is actually C code, by the way, um, with OpenGL function calls. Don't have to know any of this for this class. In fact, even for if you're curious about the final, Probably going to be it's probably going to be multiple choice, and it's not going to have you look at code samples for anything. It's going to be concept based, so, and I'll have more on that as soon as we get through Thanksgiving. So. Multiple frame buffers, as I mentioned before, we usually have more than one. Multiple frame buffers, uh, so more than one frame buffer can be defined. So useful for drawing to a different buffer than one that's being displayed. Why do you want to do that? So you can queue up the frame buffers. So if you have a single frame buffer model. You fill it up, you paint it to the screen. You fill it up, you paint it to the screen. So there's a latency. And so your action isn't going to be as quick. You're going to have flickering, or you're going to have delays where the screen doesn't update instantaneously. If you have multiple frame buffers, you fill them all up. And then while they're projecting, while they're being displayed, you take the ones that are coming off, it's like an assembly line, and you fill them back up. So you have a constant rotation of buffers that are coming through the display panel so that you can have a more streamless, smoothing, smoother flowing activity that's appearing, that's being displayed. This is double buffering algorithms. So single buffering um, is one, one buffer at a time. And a double buffering is when you have that conveyor belt 
imagine like a little circle going around and they're being just populated and then they're going back into the queue and then they're being filled back up again and then they're going around. When you have multiple buffers and you do a double buffering on it and that's basically what I'm describing there. It's a drawing for a, a stereoscopic displays. A certain type of displays actually require that um, because it needs to be refreshed constantly. It needs to be, the buffer needs to be populated. The frame buffer needs to be populating constantly in a rotation. <clears throat> so here's our front frame buffer. Here's our back frame buffer. This one goes up. This one goes up. It kind of circulates through the next one, through the back, through the back, through the back. You can also put them into sequences. So the same frame buffer is holding the same window display, and you load one first and then the next second. So you actually kind of see... Um, some primitive display is not this one, but the one that's in the auditorium. When you turn it on, you see the front buffer, then you see the next buffer, and the next. It populates slowly when it's warming up because the heat of the, the lamp bulb has to heat up and it has to actually set the colors. So you can actually kind of see that actually work when you watch projectors get turned on sometimes. And you see there's a sequence, a cycle. They're going through and then they're loading frame buffer, initial frame buffers up and they're populating it up. So you can, if you watch it real closely, you can actually kind of see that happening in the hardware by looking at what's being projected. Um, TV sets don't show you that. They're never going to show you that. But it's usually projector screens, something that's reflecting light. And you have to wait for a bulb to load up. You have to wait for a frame buffer to load. So here's our double buffering where we see the front frame buffer that is displayed. Uh, not drawn to the back frame buffer that is actively drawn to. So when finished the drawing, you switch buffers back and forth. So you have the front buffer and here's the back buffer. And you can switch between the different buffers. Um, you don't have to draw them both simultaneously and they're maybe not both being displayed simultaneously. At one point you're going to see the front or the back. So basically storing instead of one buffer You've got layers or multiple buffers, and this is just the top. The back looks, it appears to be just the top buffer without uh, the lower part. So you can set up a double buffering system with OpenGL by using, well, GL flesh is not needed when you have a double buffer because you're constantly, you're going to have your front and your back, and your back might necessarily be the next scene. It might be the next scene is what I'm saying. So the gut needs to initialize the display mode to double buffer. So you basically say use a double buffer system and then and GLUT is actually the graphic utility library that's going to tell you how to, uh, it's going to give you all of your screen display, your colors, your lighting models, all of your uh, graphic display components. Not really having anything to do with the components. So the components would be like the polygons that you're printing to the screen. And so this would be the library that captures the polygon coloring and the depth. So GLUT uh, used to swap the buffers after drawing is completed. So That's my spill on color models. I have one on light next. <laughs> These are little short little mini lectures I want to go through today to kind of give you a little bit more information. All of these are listed on the bhacker.com website under the lecture section. Talked about lighting over the last couple weeks as well and the different lighting models. Just going to give you a summary and a little overview to reinforce the points. What we're looking at is the projection of light through a plane. Where is the plane going to hit? The surface normal. So normals, this is for your vocabulary, for our purposes, additional data necessary for lighting calculations. So the normal, we usually say the surface normal or the tangent normal is the normal and then we have the tangent surface so we kind of some people actually like to use the word surface normal because it's really the surface that is exposed and the orientation that we're treating as the front as the normal is where we're going to project our lighting our color all of our different effects so this is a little example here of the normal which is going to be a flat and the normal is actually kind of an interesting concept because it's not one point it's the surface so if we took it here, and uh, if this was the tangent plane here, and we spread out, this is a round ball, in a 2D environment, we're just looking at the point in a 3D, we have to consider the surface around, because we might move that point 
So we usually do a square out, and we can define the normal in terms of its orientation to a point, generally the center point, but it doesn't have to be. So in our definition of our normal, the graphic package is going to do that for us. We're going to define the normal, and then from the normal, it's just a reference point for where we're going to cast light and what we're going to do with it. So a vector perpendicular to a point on the surface. You might think of the normal definition as a vector that's perpendicular to the point on a surface. It's going to essentially be our surface area or surface normal. Here's some normal examples. So we can define a normal for every vector and the normal should have the length of one and that would be normalized. This is just an example of using OpenGL. We don't get to do this and we don't have to do this in VRML. We don't have to worry about surface normals. It's given to us automatically. We just set our orientation on our XYZ plane and then we have it. So an example here is a triangle on an XY plane. The normal could be either 0, 0, 1 or 0, 0, negative 1 if you're looking on the top side or the underside of the normal depending upon how the object is being oriented in the plane. So it's just like when we rotate stuff. So if we define a surface normal, then we can define the back of the normal, the front of the normal, the left, the right. And so it gives us our orientation for how we're going to position the light, essentially, in the model. I'm not going to go through the calculation here because it's not going to make any sense to you, but it's a metric calculation that's going to go through um, the different function calls to define the normals for the vertex looked at and then we called the prong lighting model it's actually a blim prong um, in terms of the model this is what we looked at uh, about two weeks ago because we didn't have class last week surface lighting properties he based everything off of uh, defined by the RGB color space which is why you kind of want to know about RGB so you know well, what does that mean well from the color combinations that can be achieved we have different lighting models that can be achieved from this space one of them would be ambient light. The light reaches all points on the surface. So this lecture is actually kind of good for general definitions of these terms. Or diffuse, where the light is scattered through round surfaces. Specular lighting, where the light reflections from shiny surfaces. Specular and shiny. Shininess can also be defined in terms of uh, defining the spread of the, spec the specular term. Uh, Large values have more mirror-like um, spe uh, speculars to them. So the spe if the specular um, uh, value is set extremely high, you're going to have a shiny surface. In that case, you're going to have uh, diffuse set kind of low. So in terms of our light property here, uh, light properties for ambient, the color, and the intensity of the light that interacts with the surface material or the ambient property. So these were the uh, surface lighting properties. These are the light properties. So the surface lighting is what the surface, how's the surface going to look when we apply the lighting property, the lighting property being the ambient diffuse and the specular, which are the same thing, but it's combined with color to create the, the illusion of the light. And given that these are all mathematical calculations to produce an illusion of light and how the light's supposed to cast, which is the interesting part. Diffuse is the color and intensity of the light that interacts with the surface material or diffuse property, and then specular is the color and the intensity of the light that interacts with the surface materials for the specular property. So here's some examples. Ambience over here. See, ambient is, I always think of the ambient as kind of like everything is lighted equally. This room is supposed to be ambient, but it really isn't right now. It's more diffuse right now. Because if you look across the room, you see that we have certain sections that are lit up because the lights aren't evenly, not all the lights are turned on. So in the diffuse, you've got it hitting certain areas, but it's not illuminating the entire room. Or specular, which is not too shiny actually, but the light that is showing is a lot shinier if you look at the picture here. Actually, it even shows up on here okay too. You see this is more intense actually but we don't have, we can combine actually, we can combine it a little bit, and if we combine it, we get this over here. This is pretty much a combination of these two, because the ambient's really not gonna add anything to us. Only ambient's gonna do is essentially light up everything, but then we still have the 
the combination going on with a spec high specular value up here and down here to give us our shining points, which tells us our light's probably coming from up here. So our light's been casted this way, given the uh, the angle of the of the shadows that are appearing. But that's what's giving us our realistic model. Depending upon what we're looking for, we might turn on different ratios for the different light combinations if we're using the prong model to achieve a particular um, combination. Whose fan is that? Is that on a MacBook? Hmm. Must be on a... Whose fan's going off? That's a loud fan. Is that your fan? Wow. Dale's got loud fans. <laughs> I'm like, someone's computer's fan. Just I can hear it. <laughs> All right, here's the calculations for it. We don't have to do the calculations for it. You don't have to do it for the, any of the exams or anything. This is not a math class. Although I hear they are offering math for digital artists. <laughs> then you'll do all the math formulas in that class. So this will be the fun class. That'll be the, that'll be the. So hopefully you'll look at lighting models and you'll be able to do the mathematical calculations. And that teacher will go through all the stuff associated. I don't want to bother with it. It's like pulling teeth teaching math, especially to non-computer science people. Won't be teaching that class, thank you. <laughs> Not that I don't, I actually like math, I enjoy it. But only problem is I can't teach it. I don't have the patience for it. <laughs> Do you not have patience for that? Uh, but here, in terms of, this is not really mathematical, it's just essentially giving you all the different properties that come in combination. So the lighting would equal so much of the material ambient, so much of the diffuse, specular, shininess, etc. So the calculation for the shade values of the surface point in this particular example would end up in different categories of degrees or intensities for each one of them. And you basically would have to come up with a formula so that you added them up and they would include everything needed to achieve the effect that you were looking for. Flat shading. Flat shading. So it selects a computed color of just one vertex and populates it everywhere. So flat shading shades the entire surface as if it were laying down flat, which is good for the definition. And we also looked at Gron shading. You'll see the flat shading is pretty even. So we have the shading model that's computed for one vertex, which is copied for the rest of all of the other pixels that are taking that one value. Here we have light color that's calculated per vertex, which saves computation because then you don't have to, you can just essentially run it through an algorithm to pre-calculate the rest of it. The vertex color is bilinearly interpopulated across the polygon. So you know that you have a little bit of one, two, three vertexes calculated instead of one. So one is just going to give you one spread out everywhere. This is harder because you have to take it and populate it out manually. Here it saves you a little bit of computation because you're just taking all three and then you're going to the center point. So you have more values to interpopulate so you can stick it into an algorithm to do a recursive kind of population if you wanted to. You're getting a slightly different effect because you're getting more information that's going into the shading algorithm which is going to give you a more uh, variety in the shading that's achieved. So Here's flat versus ground shading. Flat's here, ground's here. Problem with flat? Because the entire surface is calculated with one polygon. The interpopulation of the polygons is not considered. And you can see the lines between the polygons. This has the same lines on it. But because you're using a ground shading, ground, the grud, I can never pronounce that word, shading technique instead. You're using three vertexes, so all of the vertexes are being considered of the polygon. And I think of it like a triangle. And uh, you're using that to interpopulate so you can get the seams sealed between the different polygons because you can shade them in correctly. So if you remember anything, flat gives you transitions between the polygons so you can see the surfaces clearly because they're all the same shape. Excuse me, they're all the same shade. There's no, there's no uh, calculation for any type of blending. And the grout gives you the blending. So you can't see the definitions of the separation between all the different polygons. So, which is good for some effects and not good for other effects, depending upon what you're trying to achieve, actually. Fixed functional lighting. So we have the data. The data goes into the vector operations, one of the vector operations. That's 
going to be the model. In this particular case, we're using a prong model as an example. So the model that's applied per vertex. That goes into a rasterization technique. And the rasterization is the shading. So it interpopulates the color across all of the vertexes. So we take some sample of vertexes. We apply a rasterization to get um, the rest of the vertexes, pop excuse me, the rest of the pixels populated across the entire, or I shouldn't call them pixels, but the rest of the points populated throughout the entire polygon. And then we have the fragment operation. That fragment operation is this piece of one rendered image or component fragment that gets put into the frame buffer along with all of the other stuff. So we fill up the frame buffer with all of the bits and pieces of all of the things we're rendering. And then we take those frame buffers and we put them in one by one or two by two, depending upon our um, double or single frame buffering technique, to populate the display, which is kind of interesting. So setting up the state for lighting, lighting and lights are disabled by default in OpenGL. So we can enable lighting and override and use assigned colors for the GL color calls. So if you're doing this in OpenGL, you would actually state, and OpenGL supports both lighting models. So does VRML, actually. Uh, and VRML has it turned on automatically. You just apply the light. So you say ambient light, diffuse light, and it will tell you, it will actually kind of display it for you, which is kind of interesting. The only problem is it's hard to troubleshoot that because you can't apply more than one at a time unless you put two objects on the same plane together, and then you're looking at overriding things. So it's not necessarily the most flexible not quite as user-friendly as OpenGL when it comes to this. Um, so here's our shading model set to the ground shading or set to flat shading in this particular case. Uh, GL enable uh, is going to uh, enable a fixed function lighting. So we're turning the lighting on. We're also enabling the light. So enable light zero in the scene. So in OpenGL we can enable, we can disable, we can turn things on, we can switch things off. We have a little bit more flexibility that we have in a VRML or another higher level language. So. so polygon windowing and facing. So polygons have a front and a back side, as we've seen so far. We call the front side the surface normal, which is not necessarily one polygon. It's a group of polygons that are making up what we're calling the surface, the fronting, front face of the object. Or it might actually be a side face, or it might actually be a top or a bottom face, depending upon our definition of their normal. So the lighting can be defined differently for either side. Which is how you turn something upside down and the back side's black and the front side's all lit up. Which is kind of interesting. Not very realistic. Because if you had a light source shining on an object and you turned it upside down, well then the back would be shining as well. So that makes for unrealistic kind of graphics. When one, shine, one side is shiny and the other side's not. Because <laughs> you moved it over. So you can apply to both sides, depending upon the angle of the lighting, in terms of the source. You can do it individually. So here's our front side. Vertices are defined in a counterclockwise order with respect to the pro projection view model transformation. Talked about projections, talked about views, in terms of the models. So we put that together to give us our perspective, and our perspective is going to be um, what we're going to use to determine which is the front and which is the back side. So if the front side is supposed to be illuminated and now the back normal surface is now the front normal surface, then we illuminate it then. So if we do that, then we can essentially um, rotate and make the front side the new back side and the back side the new front side as soon as everything gets ro rotated, considering the projection view model transformation that's taking place which gives us our hidden surface removal. If we know we have a backside, and we know it's not facing forward, and we know we're not going to illuminate it, why should we even paint it to begin with? It doesn't exist. The only reason why we'd want to paint it is because if we were going to move quick enough, we don't want to paint it in real time. So we can pre-paint it. It's there, which means the buffers are already filled with the information that needs to be there. And we flip the image real quickly, and then all of a sudden we see the image show and we see the backside correctly. That's the risk you take when you use hidden surface removal. When you turn it on, uh, you are having it do it automatically when the animation is occurring. So that's how you end up with scenes that look like, oh, wait a minute, it's painting. Whoa, ha, ha, what happened to the back of that guy's leg? Oh, no, oh, there it is now. So you see it filling in. 
because it's going to be blacker. Yeah, everyone's seen this in primitive old video games when the action just moves too fast and then you see a hollow arm or you see the backside that's not painted or just for a split second and it catches your eye because it's abnormal and your eye will catch it actually because it doesn't look right. It's, it's playing with your imagination. Um, well, it actually could be that, that they're using hidden surface removal and it's not painting fast enough. The processor is not fast enough to paint it in real time. So, what is hidden system re hidden surface removal often desirable to not render the backside of the polygons unless they're needed, which means because less rendering you're doing, the um, faster the image is going to be rendered. So this can be done by defining the size you want to cool. To cool is the pool, so you can first enable cooling, and cooling is going to essentially do. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically going to turn on the hidden surface removal so you can cut away what you don't need. So you define the enable, you enable, then you define which face to cool. And then the polygons facing forward are the ones that are going to be populated, the other ones are going to be cooled. So you can get rid of and remove polygons that aren't in the visual view plane. So assigning material properties, here we have a, a, another, this is OpenGL code, by the way, because the code is not available in VRML, so it's, it's OpenGL uh, capability. You can't do, you can't do back face cooling, uh, hidden, sus, hidden surface removal in VRML, it just doesn't exist in terms of the properties. Um, but here for the face, the geometry that is face, facing to assign the peanut and material property to assign, the parameters pointing to the array values to assign in terms of assigning the properties. So OpenGL calls that take array pointers as well. So some sets of OpenGL methods can take multiple numbers and types of arguments, meaning it's going to take two here, it's going to be a float value. A uh, type of argument here is float or integer, number of arguments two. Um, the method takes an array pointer arguments for v, uh, for vector. So we have essentially the ability to run OpenGL functions that take on any number of parameters given the number of parameters we want to set. So we have to pick the OpenGL function that's going to work for us given the situation. Don't really have to go through OpenGL code in this class because we're not programming in OpenGL. But you can kind of get an idea. It's just function calls sending different sets of parameters depending upon which function is being used to set the ambient, the fuse, the shininess. So, <clears throat> so GLUT can render simple geometry, spheres, boxes, cones, doors, teapots. This is what you're getting with VRML. It's actually a wrapper to GLUT, and GLUT's the one that's actually painting the surface for you. It's creating the object. And so we have a number of different uh, things that we can take into consideration for definitions, radius, slices, stacks, and stuff like that. So. In terms of light for OpenGL lighting, it's the same actually as the prong model. So we have the ambient diffuse and the specular, which are common properties and different types. The different types of lights, we get the same thing in VRML as well. We get directional light, pointed light, and spotlights. And now uh, we can say spotlight this, point light that. So we assign the light properties to give us the different type of light. And I think I've gone through the lighting models actually with you already, but this light set might actually have. Yeah, it does. It goes through the different lighting models, and I'll just briefly review that as well then. Not gonna, I'm going to skip through the code because we're not programming in OpenGL in this class. So, The point light is exactly what it means. It's a point. It's like the pointer tool, you know, those little red pointer things that cats like, that instructors like to use. It's a point light. So light source is originating in from a zero volume point to the scene. So it casts light in all directions. So we can do a position, um, and the position is important for a point. For a directional light, it's like a flashlight. You have more than one point, but you have the same concept. It's still in a direction. So the light is infinitely far away and drawn to the scene from a particular direction. And in fact, you can see a visual up here. Here's the yellow. Multiple directions or a single. In this particular case, we've got a single light for which the light is dispersing out of a single point versus directional, which is hitting a surface at a particular direction, which is you know, kind of like a flashlight, sort of. Used most often for illuminating sunlight. So distance from the sun to the earth is large, so the 
light direction can be considered the same in the sun to the earth. So. Or we have the spotlights, which is a little bigger light. It's also directional. So the light source originating from a zero volume point into the scene, so in the scene. So we have from a zero point instead of from, you know, a huge set of points coming into another set of points in a certain direction. Now we have one light that's coming in, which is why they call it a spot, from one spot, one, one light source coming in, and it's spanning out the illuminated area. Just think about when, uh, you know, they have, you know, artists or something, a musician on stage, and they put a spotlight on them, or, I don't know, an entertainer of some sort. Uh, so we have the direction we have to, and when we define these light sources, we actually have to set the parameters that are associated with it. And this one here has direction, <coughs> cutoff, and exponent. So the direction is direction of light that is focused on. What direction is it going in? Cutoff is the angle that defines the light cone. So a lot of these lights actually have manual controls for it. So have you ever seen them adjusting the light? Uh, some when it gets smaller, it gets bigger. It can move the light around, the character moves and stuff. Our exponent uh, concentrating concentration of the light, the brightest around the center. In fact, most of the more are effective have a center point to the light, or you can have it so it's the same intensity throughout the entire radius that's being projected. And if you were programming this in OpenGL, you would do something like this, where you'd specify out the light position, the direction, the cutoff, the exponential, or the how intense the light is at what point. So that's everything you wanted to know about lighting. And for our next topic, looking at, lo and behold, shading. <laughs> so OpenGL shading, another small little 24 lecture slide. Comes from a different source, has more OpenGL code in it, but we've already talked about shading a little bit, but so let's see what we're looking at. And uh, I'm going to skip through the source code part of it because we don't really need to worry about that, but we've actually talked about this model, and so you'll see it coming together hopefully. Objective of this is to look at the different shading objects so that their images appear three-dimensional. Shading can give us a three-dimensional effect. Introduce the different types of light material interactions, which is interesting, and then build a simple reflective model. Prong model can be used, real-time graphics hardware. So prong model is actually used a lot in uh, most applications. So we're looking at why do we need shading? Suppose we build a model of a sphere using many polygons and color it with a GL color. It might look like something like this, but we want this. See, this doesn't have any shading on it on the top, but this has shading. So this is more realistic looking. So don't need shading. Shading doesn't really do anything. However, it adds realism. <laughs> I mean, we can still see the picture and then usually it's the shading that's improperly applied. Like the sun's coming this way and the shade is like in front of the sun. And then that usually, we look at that and we go, what's wrong with that picture? In fact, there's a book out there that's got, um, it went through and looked at artwork, computer generated artwork. And uh, it compared and it shows you like, you know, I don't know, like a 20 or 30 pictures. And you look at the picture, you go, well, it looks right, but there's something wrong, but you don't know what's wrong. And then underneath it'll tell you, oh, the shading's wrong, or the lighting's wrong, or the color, or the... It's like when you go to Las Vegas and you're inside, um, there's, one, there's one casino that is, uh, looks like daylight. Um, I think it's the Bellagio or something. It's got like, you know, the sky and clouds and stuff. And you walk through that going, okay, it feel, feels like sunlight. It feels like the daytime and it's the middle of the night, but something's wrong with this scene. Well, it's because of the pattern of the, and the clouds never move. So if you've ever wondered, and you said, because like one, one day I actually did this, I'm saying, well, what is wrong with this scene? Because it feels like it's daylight. I got the blue sky, a couple clouds, but the clouds aren't moving. Anyway, so they fixed it so one of the rooms, the clouds actually move and it gets dark and then it gets light again. That's a more realistic effect because who's outside and it always looks the same? It never happens that way. Like today you walk outside, it looks different than it did yesterday. So if you sit in there long enough, you notice it. So they, they're starting to experiment with it to move the, they have clouds that move now in there. Um, 
And actually, you know what it, what it is? It's just a video that's being projected on a screen. <laughs> so you just change the video so it brings in storm clouds occasionally, and then, you know, clouds go away. But the clouds are supposed to move. Anyway, but they don't move. So. Long story short, not very realistic to me, because I notice that everybody else goes, oh, look, it looks like daylight. It's like, yeah, but there's always something wrong with that. There's something wrong. So shading, why does the image of a real sphere look like? Well, what does it, why, why does the image of a real sphere look like this? Well, we have the light material that interacts. It causes each point to have a different color or a shade. The color is actually changing. So you need to consider light sources, material properties, location of the viewer, and surface orientation. So that's when you get... Um, if you've seen the professional photography, they always take like a makeup powder and they'll powder down somebody's face because they don't want the shine. <laughs> because the shine is an effect of the lighting hitting the oils on the skin, which is a water liquid surface, so it's going to illuminate. So you put the powder to remove the shine because if you're sitting there in your living room, why would you have a big old light shining on you? <laughs> Nobody sits under those lights in everyday worlds. So if you're going to sit under one of those lights, why do you have the light? Because the person who's taking the picture or doing the filming needs to illuminate to capture all the color combinations. Otherwise, you're going to get and remove shading. Because if you have shading that comes out of that with smaller light, you'll get shading. And if you have shading, not very realistic. It doesn't give you a more realistic. So when you look at professional photography that's illuminated correctly with no shine on faces and no red eye and no other kind of dead giveaways that it's a picture, the scene looks more real. It looks more authentic versus someone took a picture or someone, you know, did this on their little video camera or something, um, which is kind of interesting. So it makes photography look better. Um, to remove the effects that uh, you have to do to the scene to get to capture the data that you want to capture causes side effects so you remove the side effects and it makes the picture look better so it has nothing to do with the person everybody's skin is going to shine regardless because everybody has oils on their skin unless you're a reptile and you don't have any oil on your skin the light's not going to hit anything <laughs> normally you have oils on your skin so not naturally so Anyway, and some people end up with shiny hair, actually, because they put product in their hair, and the product has some sort of an oil component to it. And so when the light hits it, then they have glowing hair in the, in the scene. So that's really bad. Scattering is a concept. So the light strikes A, and then some scattering, and then some absorb. It's like when you shine a big old light on something, some of it's going to absorb, and some of it's going to scatter, some of it's going to bounce and hit other objects. Some of the scattering light strikes B, so we shined it on surface A. Some of it's going to hit B. Some of this light's going to hit B. So some might scatter, some might absorb. Some of the scattered light of A and so on. So both of these are going to sort of illuminate each other, but if the light source is here, we're going to have the light hitting the surface and then bouncing or scattering, which is called scattering. The light's going to scatter. This is actually what you get with uh, illumination. So. Uh, rendering equation. So an infinite scattering and absorption of light can be described in terms of a rendering equation. So it cannot be solved in general. Actually, it can't be, but we have ray tracing, which is a special case of perfectly reflecting surfaces. So ray tracing takes, and I have an entire lecture on ray tracing, and we still haven't perfected it, but it's tracing the light from the source, it was that ray tracing, tracing it from the source to all of the surfaces it's supposed to hit and doing a calculation. So if it hits here at a certain degree, a certain amount of it's going to hit right here, a certain amount's going to hit here, how far is it going to span, based off of lighting models. And then if this is going to hit here, and what else is in the area? So it takes it from a starting point, traces the light through objects. Some objects are going to pass the light through them. Some of them are going to absorb them. Some of them are going to cast shadows on other objects. That's what ray tracing does. It's a way of mathematically calculating that out so that you can um, 
project the realism of the light, so you can, so you can see what's going to happen with that. So ray tracing is a special case for perfectly reflecting surfaces. Yeah, not quite solving it yet either, actually. But scattering, rendering equations, and scattering evaluations don't necessarily solve the problem on their own, which is why ray tracing is a very popular approach to it. Rendering equation is global and includes shadows, multiple scattering from object to object. So here's the global effect. Here's the sun, and we have shadows that come over here, and a shadow here, a shadow here. We have multiple reflections, so this one's going to reflect here, which is going to cast it out this way. And then we have translucent, maybe, surfaces that are going to glow. They're going to absorb the light. Maybe some of the lights are going to... As an example, if you have a window, and you have light hitting the window, but no light's hitting anything inside of the room, I'm not going to look very realistic. Because <laughs> a light in a window should cast light into the room. In fact, if you study the way the windows work, and a lot of people who work with graphics actually go out and just look at the real world. If you look at the real world and you look at a window, you know what the you know that the light actually transforms. It's not a direct one to one. So the light that hits goes through doesn't actually go through the window. The window acts as a prism, so it changes color, and can actually you can actually detect the color of it, and then it'll go through at a certain angle depending upon the angle that's come through the front surface will come out of the back surface at a different angle and it's going to have different illumination properties depending upon the type of light that's coming through the window which is kind of interesting so uh, it's interesting to see the effects and then it's going to bounce so if you have a mirror in the window or if you have another lighted surface in the window it might illuminate most of the room it might not illuminate anything at all it might actually show interesting uh, shadows so and that's kind of hard to put that windows uh, lamp lighting and window lighting is kind of tricky to get to, to perfect realistically um, in computer graphics, although it's not, it's not hard. I mean, it's not um, impossible. So local versus global rendering. So the correct shading requires a global calculation involving all of the objects and light sources because we have to consider everything in the room. You just can't cast a light onto one object. It has to be on everything. Incorporates with pipeline model, which shades every polygon independently for a local rendering. However, in computer graphics, especially real-time graphics, we're happy if things just look right. So sometimes, sometimes you can just fudge it so that, yeah, half the shadow showing, that's fine. Or we get part of it looks good, but we have no reflection. Nothing, nothing is being reflected off of any other item. But it just looks right versus it doesn't look right. So we would just want it to look normal. Existing, uh, there exist many different techniques for approximating the global effects as well. So we have the light material interaction to consider. So the light that strikes an object is partially absorbed and then it is partially scattered or reflected. Um, and then reflection actually refers to actually sending the light as well, repeating the light. A scatter is to send the light in all directions further than the point of its contact. So it's being scattered, it's being displaced in multiple different areas. Reflection means take the light and actually shine, make a new light source out of it and shine it on another surface to reflect it. So it continues the strength of the light and causes its own scattering technique. Or it causes its own reflection. So it's like taking a mirror and reflecting something off of a mirror. So the amount, and you can reflect with objects, you can turn reflection on or turn it off. You can turn scattering on and off as well. So the amount of reflection determines the color and the brightness of the object. And a surface appears red under white light uh, because the red component of the light is reflected and the rest is absorbed. So if you have a you know, light colored light with a white light or a white light with a colored surface, you know, you'll get different properties that show up. You take a white light on a red surface, the light will be absorbed into the red surface. You'll see the red. So. Reflective light is scattered in a manner that deflects on the smoothness and the orientation of the surface. So, actually, you can take a yellow light, scan it on a red surface. What does yellow and red give you? Like green or something? No, it's yellow and blue gives you green. So. You can actually see some realistic color alterations with colored light. So, but usually the sun isn't really yellow. It's just yellow when it's painted. 
but the light may not necessarily be a bright light. So, so we have different light sources, and here's our light source here. General light sources are difficult to work with because we must integrate light coming from all points in the source. So here we have a light bulb. So we have point one over here and point two over here. How big is the area of the projection of the light? Well, it depends on how big the bulb is. Bigger bulbs give you more light, <laughs> just like in real life. But it's kind of interesting, actually, to look at a light bulb. You can't really tell the center point, and you don't know how many points are actually being the start or the center of the light source. So generally, you have an area that's considered the source, and the area includes all, the, includes all of the points that make up the, the source. So in our simple light source, we have a point source, a spotlight source, and then the ambient light, which is the same model we use in the prong system, actually. So the point source models with the position and the color, and the distance is equal to the infinite distance away or parallel. Spotlight restricts the light from the ideal point source, and ambient light, the same amount of light everywhere in the scene. So can model contra contributions of many different sources and reflections of surfaces. So. Actually, it's kind of interesting because if you look at the ambient light in the back of this room, you can't tell the source of the lighting when you look at the objects. You know, I'm facing this direction so I can kind of see it, but we don't know the source, so it's all in all directions. So. so surface types, which is kind of interesting. So we have the smooth, so the smoother surface the more reflective light is concentrated in the direction of the perfect mirror that would reflect the light. So coarse doesn't reflect light, smooth reflects light, which is why metals, smooth metals, reflect more light than non-smooth, like matte metals. So every, uh, for every rough surface is scattered light in all directions. The smooth surface is more directional. The rough surface does it in all directions. Because we, and it's not as intense because the light is scattered. It's not directional. It's not pointed in a particular direction. So on a shiny surface, like a piece of metal, we can actually use it like a mirror because we can get, and a mirror is probably the smoothest glass surface you could possibly get as a model. That's going to send it off in one direction, and you can point the light, actually, with a mirror. In fact, people burn things all the time in the hot sun. And kids do this. They put a piece of paper on the sidewalk. You take a magnifying glass or a mirror. Actually, just a piece of metal works, too, and you reflect the sun down onto a certain point because it's very directional. It'll hit the surface at a particular point, and it'll send it off in a direction. And you concentrate it long enough, and it will burn the paper, <laughs> start a little fire. Insects. They do that where? To insects. It, to insects. Well, okay, maybe in your country. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, they do that here, too. Actually, so... Uh, there's a couple of kids down the street last summer that were doing it to fruit. They were making dried fruit this way, and they were cooking hot dogs this way. I thought that that was the most bizarre thing because they had aluminum foil out, and I'm like, what's on the foil? You know, they took some fruit, and they took a, I think it was a mirror, or I, one, one of them was a magnifying glass, and I think it was for the fruit. The other one was a mirror, and they were playing around with it. And you can cook, you can cook this way. You can like cook eggs, cook fruit, you can dehydrate fruit, uh, cook hot dogs, and you can cook bugs, too, <laughs> apparently. I've never tried bugs. Um, I guess as kids, you know, they're going to burn bugs. I guess it's better than burning paper, so, which could set houses on fire. So. Long story short, keep reflective items away from your children. <laughs> they're as bad as matches. If you can understand light and the way that highly reflective objects project it, you can essentially create a pointed surface, a very shiny surface that takes a sunlight in a very hot day, that is if it's not cloudy, <laughs> and you have the light shining down, and the intensity of that light is strong enough, you can burn something with it. Normally you're not going to burn anything with it. But if you think of the concept, that's why skin cancer is such an issue for most people, because as we get closer and closer, as the ozone gets burnt away, as the years go by, the sun is more intense because there's not as much as a, much of a blocking of the potential rays. So on very, very hot days, easy to get sunburned if you don't put anything protective on your skin. When you're putting protective on your skin, it's actually kind of interesting. If you put oil, for the same reason I mentioned with the photography, it absorbs the light. Which is why you put coconut butter and butter and oils, and then you'll get tan. 
Well, because you're just asking for the light to come on in and come in and, and burn and do your thing to my skin, right? Which is not so good, actually. And then you put the other, which is sort of like the equivalent to the powder, the other substance which deflects, which is the sunscreen components that they put in sunscreen that, you know, it's also in a liquid. It's also in something. And some of them are very shiny as well. However, it has nothing to do with the shiniest property. It's the block property. So they're putting a block of a say, protective matte surface, essentially, that's covering the skin so it won't absorb the light, so you won't get burned, So, which is kind of like the concept of su a sunscreen. It works with gamma rays. And how much of the rays is it going to let in? Well, that's your SPF rating on your, if you could take a chemistry course, the first thing you do Chem 1 is you uh, measure sun, sometimes you measure sunscreen, <laughs> so to tell well, what in the world is this doing, and it's blocking rays, it's blocking light, essentially. And so most of them pretty much do the same thing, some of them are a little bit better than others, depends upon the reflective, how much reflective property is in the lotion itself, and then how much of the, of the absorption um, is being deflected from the resistance property that's being put in there that's going to deflect instead of absorb the light. So let's do with chemicals. So here's our prong model. So a simple model that can be computed rapidly. So it has three components to it, the diffuser specular and the ambient. And uh, you use four vectors, a source of viewer, a normal, and a reflect a perfect reflector. Here's our perfect reflector here. And we put in the, uh, the ratios that we want for each one of the components in the model. The ideal reflector, the normal is determined by the local orientation and the angle of the incident or equals the angle of the reflection. And then we have three vectors that uh, must be coplanar that works with this process. Gives you a pointed ideal vector. Lamberton surface perfectly diffuses reflector, so light scattered equally in all of the different directions. The amount of light reflected is proportional to the vertical component of the incoming light, so it's used with a calculation. You don't have to worry about any of the calculations associated with any of the different light sources or properties. Specular surfaces here, we have a specular highlight. You can see this is where the light's actually hitting it. This is the light spot on the uh, surface. Most surfaces are neither ideal diffusers nor are they perfect speculars. So they're ideal reflectors, which means not everything has a mirror property to it. If the world walked around with mirror properties all over themselves, we'd be like shiny disco balls. And everybody would be projecting light on everybody else, and the world would be kind of wild and crazy. Uh, so we don't walk around like shiny disco balls. We don't wear reflective clothing normally, yeah, unless we're happen to be in the street or something, working on in the street. And if surfaces in a regular everyday life, it's not very appealing to be so shiny. So smooth surfaces show specular highlights due to incoming light being reflected in directions and concentrating close to the direction of a perfect reflector. But we can't make it perfect anyway because uh, it wouldn't be very realistic. And for the same reason why we don't walk around like shiny disco balls. Otherwise, that would be very unrealistic as well. It might actually make for a good sci-fi movie, but that's about it. Uh, so modeling the specular reflections, the prong proposed, using the term of the drop-off as the angle between the viewer and the ideal reflective increases. So we have the reflective intensity, the absorbed coefficient, the incoming intensity, and the shininess coefficient to put in here to give us our intensity ratio. And we also have the shininess coefficient that we can do, which is another calcula calculation to determine well, how shiny is this supposed to be. How shiny is the surface so we can illuminate the light correctly. And in terms of, uh, and you don't have to know any of the calculations, by the way, so I'm going to kind of sort of skip through it. But if you're interested, they're in here. Mm, ambient light is the result of multiple interactions between large light sources and uh, objects in the environment. So the amount of color depending upon uh, both of the light sources, uh, the, the color of the light and the material, the properties that are being projected. In terms of distance terms, the light from the point source that reaches the surface is intensely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So we can add a factor of, and here's a form calculation to diffuse in specular terms. So. 
Let's see, light sources, material properties. Let me see what else. This, I believe this is the end of the lecture, actually. Um, in terms of the light sources, and just one more thing on distance terms. The, um, what we're looking at is uh, basically calculating the distance between the light source and the surface that it's hitting. Because the further the distance is away, the less intense the light is when it hits the contact. We can see this in the real world. Which makes it interesting because when you have a flashlight or a sun that's way far away that casts a huge shadow, you wonder, well, how far away is it? it usually means it's closer. So if you're out in the sun, it's usually closer as a source versus reflected sunlight off of another surface. Which is how shading, going back to what I was saying about windows, the light reflects differently because it's not as intense. It's more ambient. The light that comes through a window has a more of an ambient effect than it does a spotlight or it does any other type of direction because there's no direction associated with it. It just illuminates, illuminates the room usually, so, depending upon the angle that's coming in. Light sources. So we can add results for different light sources and combine different light sources together to create real realistic scenes. So each light source has a separate diffuse, specular, and ambient term that allows the maximum flexibility it does not have any physical justification to it. In fact, that's what you get when you uh, look at computer graphics lighting. You put everything in combinations using these models, but there's no real life correlation to that. There's no like physical property that you're actually doing. You're just using, a, it's sort of like cooking actually. You're just putting combinations of ingredients together and it formulates into something that you're going to use. And depending upon the recipe, you might actually have it come out a couple of different ways depending upon the combination that you're using. And then that combination is what makes the food desirable or not desirable, depending upon the palate of the person eating it. So, uh, so we have separate red, green, and blue components as well, and hence nine coefficients for each one of the light sources, because we have to consider all of the different options if we're going to use this model. So material properties uh, match light sources with properties, nine, absorptive, nine absorption coefficients, shininess coefficients as well that can be used to affect. So. So we add up the components and we put them together for each one of the light sources and uh, we get the final result. And for each color component we add contributions from all sources to see what effect we're going to get. Here's an example. So only differences in these is the teapots are parameterized in the prong model. So we have some that are shiny and some that are This row here is not so shiny. This row here has got a little bit more shininess to it. This has got more directional. So. You might not be able to tell the differences between the teapots. Actually, these look pretty dark over here. Unfortunately, when you take that effect that's supposed to be here and you run it through a projector and you translate the image, it gets lost. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. When you, I look at this slide on my computer screen, it looks different than what you're looking at, actually. The shininess, this is not quite as dark. This is actually pretty shiny. But it's a dark, it's a matte surface. So it's not necessarily going to look shiny out here, which is kind of interesting. The effect is completely lost on the projector. So. That's everything you want to know about shading for today. So I'm going to stop this video. Stop.